people that are just joining for the first time are probably thinking that we are a crazy bunch here playing some random guitar intros or more like I'm a crazy bunch here. So that's not every day. That's just on special occasions like this one because we have got two amazing beings with us. As you know, I just gave them the intro. So let's start off by just saying what we're doing here. This is Data on Kubernetes Community. If you have not been here before, join us in Slack where we are talking about all things data, running data, heavy workloads on Kubernetes, how you're doing stateful, how you're messing around with operators, what are you doing with your databases, what is it, why is data so hard? What is that? So we will, I'll drop a Slack link in here in case you're not in the community already. I will let you know where the link is. It's in the chat now. And other than that, I think I don't have any other announcements for today. I'm excited to talk with you both, David and Jeremy. This has been a long time coming. We set it up, I, I think, a month ago or so. So let me just start with you, Jeremy. Can you give us a bit of background on how you came to be this, uh, in this position at Packet? And how did you even get into tech? Into tech, probably for, it was always the, um, I think always the direction I was headed. Uh, always liked computers, always liked taking things, uh, taking things apart. Um, and uh, was the place that, uh, uh, where it, it felt like everything was happening. And so, um, took, you know, the max number of um, computing classes in high school and then on to, on to college, went to, went to Michigan Tech in Michigan's Upper Peninsula and uh, studied more uh, programming and business and uh, in information systems. And then from there, uh, ended up in a, uh, at a city planner, so doing a lot of uh, GIS and, um, and then from uh, and then from there, always in other companies, some uh, some much bigger like General Motors, some much smaller like fourteen person uh, fourteen person startups or, or three person startups that uh, that didn't quite make it out of the uh, make it out of the garage, but was always a um, um, always like the uh, ability to uh, either create something out of nothing or have something that works while I sleep or um, mm. be able to. Uh, multiply my efforts and intention in the form of a, uh, in the form of code and, um, packet. I think I came across, uh, inside a, uh, inside another Slack that I'm a, a part of. Somebody mentioned that they needed, uh, additional hands and, uh, was a, uh, space I find very interesting. The, uh, being at a, uh, 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 bare metal provider of, uh, data centers and connection is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a candy store. So instead of working on one edge of a, uh, um, of a very large problem, there's, uh, there's any number of directions that it can, uh, that it can be taken. And so the, the number of people that I'm able to interface with is the, uh, feels the largest possible. And then, um, was absolutely drawn to the, uh, uh, drawn to the team, everyone who I, uh, everyone who I interacted with, I had an excellent experience, which wasn't the, um, which wasn't quite the case at, um, at every place, uh, that I'd, uh, considered when, when thinking of, um, when thinking of a next step, um, I, which I also appreciate those folks who, uh, who, who were candid and gave me get out vibes during, uh, <laughs> during discussions. Um, it, like I said, not at packet, but, uh, but other spots was, was, was very useful. And that's, uh, um, and I guess as we're talking about today, sometimes the, the, the bad example can be better than a, uh, can be better than a good one. Mm -hmm. And that is true. Just so everyone is on the same page with us, we are going to be talking a little bit about, about that today, the bad examples, the what not to do, how not to do it. But before we jump into all of that, David, can you give us a bit of background on how you got into tech and what brought you here? Yeah, sure, definitely. Uh, so I think I've made a, a lot of wrong choices in my life, and that's probably why I'm here. Uh, so I actually failed computing in high school to the point where I was so annoyed um, that I wasted my entire summer on the internet with my dial-up modem working on something called a, a Telnet Talker. I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but it used to be like this chat system 
oh god what 1998 or something like that based on the telnet protocol not very secure and we used to type messages to each other and then if you were on an advanced one which was called like a mud you could like play dungeons and dragons over text it was really cool anyway i spent my entire summer hacking on these things and adding new features to it and got really good at programming over the summer went back to high school got really bored and then dropped it so I didn't go to college or anything like that. But I was very fortunate, I guess, that I got my first software job in the year 2000. So I was like 17, 18. Uh, and it's just been a slippery slope ever since. Um, oh. I've worked for small companies as a developer. When you work for a small company as a developer, you wear many hats, which means I also did operations. I also did database administration. You know, you just take on everything. And there was no cloud back then. So I kind of feel like I've come full circle in a sense that I started on bare metal writing my own code and I'm back to working on bare metal and I'm just going to try and my best to forget about that cloud era in the middle okay. um, and the team at Packet is really important like Jeremy said um, I had worked with Tom who's on our team before and I knew everyone else I knew a handful of the people through the Kubernetes community through the container and Docker community and it just all the pieces came together it worked out pretty well Nice. So along this chat, if anybody out there listening has some questions you want to throw in, feel free to drop them into the Q&A section or the chat itself, and we'll try and answer all of your questions. My first question for you is, I mean, what have you seen? You wanted to share some war stories with us, right? So I'd love to jump into all of the war stories and this like doing data wrong as we labeled it. Is there some things that you have seen that are just big no-nos and that jump out at you? Kind of, Let's start from the very high level and we'll get a bit deeper as we go along. So the question is, are there any major no-nos for running data on Kubernetes? Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's so difficult, right? I mean, Kubernetes has come a long way in the last five years. Um, you know, if we if we remove stateful sets, which are relatively new in comparison, I guess, you know, trying to run a database on Kubernetes using something like a deployment is is really going to get you into a lot of trouble. Um, there's a lot of really nice uh, semantics that come with a stateful set. So if you are going down this journey of saying, hey, I'm going to run a database on Kubernetes and you're not using a stateful set, then you better be damn sure you know what you're doing because it's going to hurt. So, yeah, don't use deployments. Um, and then if we just, I don't know what the biggest no-no would be, to be fair. Like, <laughs> you, you kind of get stuck in this weird position with data on Kubernetes and that data has gravity, right? Data is, data is heavy. You cannot just lift it and shift it and move it around. So you've got two choices. Do I use a cloud-native distributed database by default, something like CockroachDB? Or do I use something like MariaDB or MySQL and then try to handle the replication through another way? Um, and each of those have their own major drawbacks, which we can kind of touch on as we as we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would be great. Jeremy, did you have any ideas? Of yeah, yeah. The um, I think there's so uh, in the in like one of the Tolstoy novels. There's the uh, when you ask for like what's <laughs> there's never one right thing, but never one wrong thing. But the Tolstoy quote I was thinking of right is that uh, happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And that's the same, like, same story with stacks, right? Like there's, um, when everything's working, no one cares why, no one cares why it works, but there's so many different ways that things can break. And when raising, um, uh, I'll drop a, 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 a Twitter link in the, uh, uh, in the Slack chat. Um, uh, one instance of doing things wrong I, I saw was, uh, not putting your toys away. So, uh, because you're, uh, when you're, uh, leasing either, uh, hardware or, or virtual machines by either the minute or the hour, uh, they, they bring with them incredible power, but that also means that, uh, you're, you're spending on them too. And so, um, it's the, it's the classic, uh, shot chaser for Twitter, the, um, the initial post and, um, uh, not making a uh, fun or light. It's a great thing to learn from. Um, from a user that says the cloud is amazing, just spun up 20,000 computers to chug through regenerating our image previews in our new style in 23 real world minutes, cost $10 and um, saved myself three months. And the next morning, uh, the, the return comes like, 
this is horrible. I left the instances running and got billed thousands of dollars. And so um, we, we so often talk about the ease of bringing up, um, bringing up infrastructure and, and getting everything going but, um, and, and scaling up, but, but forgetting to um, turn things back down and uh, wind them off, especially as a smaller company that may not have the budget for thousands of dollars of, uh, of infrastructure spend is a, uh, one way to go wrong. Yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot pretty easily. So, David, uh, getting back to this idea of which database you're going to look at, and you were saying, do you want to go with something like Cockroach or Maria DB? Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen on both ends of those and how that looks? Yeah, certainly. So, I guess I forgot to answer the last question also because I got say tracked with my own my own thought patterns there. But the, the, my biggest no-no has to be using NFS for your backing store or for the underlying disk. Like, mm. um, I made a horrible mistake with a really trivial example, which didn't actually hurt me too much, but using EFS, which is an Amazon managed NFS across the clusters. Um, uh, <laughs> for something as silly as a small Postgres database at back to GitLab at the time. And there's this really annoying thing with EFS. I'm not sure if anyone's used it, but uh, it has this concept called burst credits. And what they do, because you know Amazon is like a drug dealer, they give you 10,000 burst credits for free. And then you don't realize, because who monitors this stuff, that these burst credits are slowly falling down and falling down. Eventually, you get to zero. And the problem was is that GitLab raised loads and loads of small files. Anyway, you run out of burst credits, Amazon charge you a load of money to get that working again. Um, so there's my biggest no-no. Don't run NFS or any variant of it. Even if the cloud manage it for you, you're still going to have a bad time. Even if they give you free burst credits. Oh, yeah, definitely. You. Yeah. And I, I don't think I would ever go down that path again of, of using distributed storage layer, particularly for my databases. You've got to really work as close to the metal as possible if you want the, the, the performance benefits that most databases require. Hmm. Now, talking about the differences between distributed databases uh, and uh, I don't know what the other word would be, monolithic databases, I guess, is like there's a trade-off regardless of which one you're going to pick. So distributed da databases like CockroachDB are really cool. Even Kafka, I guess, would fit this model. And uh, I can horizontally scale the database. Each database uses its own storage on the metal. Works just fine. Um, but the disaster recovery scenarios are a lot more difficult to operate. What if you lose more than your quotum immediately for whatever reason? It could be bad planning, rack aware, data center aware, whatever. Um, you're in a pickle where you're really going to struggle to get that database back online. However, if you go down the monolithic database approach like MariaDB or Postgres, then you have to handle the replication yourself. And that's another really difficult challenge as well. A lot of these databases just aren't built to be distributed. Um, and there's a lot of painful things you can really do to try and make that work. So you really got to pick the lesser of two evils. And that's very much dependent on what your use case is and what you actually need to achieve from having that data. And, and something else I'll throw in with the distributed one sounds great as long as if I plan for the failures that I'm never going to lose my quorum. Cool. But then the chances are that you're also going to be potentially using Ceph or Gluster or OpenEBS or Portworx under the hood. So then that distributed database with a replication factor of three is running on a disk partition that has a replication of three and then you're paying for that data nine times. You that's, know, that's such a good question that I actually, I wanted to ask that, like, how do you manage that? Because there's a lot of companies that have this replication. And so how can you properly balance that? Have you figured out a way? Uh, I, I don't think there is one true path, not at yeah. all. Uh, you know, I have a lot of experience working with MongoDB. I know it gets a lot of uh, criticisms, but I think it's a really strong database. Um, and some of its concerns are like, yeah, if I want to be able to write something to the database, it's going to wait for the replication to happen. Um, if I want a replication factor of two, it's going to write it twice before it responds to my write saying, yeah, that was okay. But then how long does that latency add to the request? And then if I don't accept that, am I willing to accept, you know, reads that aren't always up to date? Like, again, there's no one true path here. You really need to understand your application. It may be that you don't need to write consistency and you'll accept latency on the reads, or maybe you definitely need to read consistency and then you have to just take the hit there as well. 
Mm. And then with regards to the underlying storage, you know, even if you do have a cluster of MongoDBs or cockroaches or wherever they are, and you've got your replication factors and that's working well, the chances are you're either then running on uh, open EBS, which is a really good example with that extra replication factor. So you've got all this redundancy, but you're paying for it. Or you then have to kind of have really strong backup model and you have to test those backups. And that's something that people take for granted. Like if I run MongoDB backup and don't test it, does that ever actually work? And, and the operability there and the tools that you need to do and the investment and time, maybe you're better off paying for that 9x replication. Who knows? Like, you know your team, you have to make a decision. Mm-hmm. Such a good point. I don't know if you wanted to drop anything in there, Jeremy, or I should cruise on to the next question. Yeah, the um, uh, having um, uh, having backups that work is a uh, is a huge one. Anytime you're um, talking data, anything anything that exists one place exists zero places. Really, the whole you know when going into the wilderness, um, two is one, and 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 one is none. And so there's oftentimes the, the, the comfort of fit. Like the only thing worse than not having backups is thinking that you have backups instead of knowing that you have backups. Such a good point. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the horror stories that was a, um, a large part in uh, when looking at um, w- different ways that data has gone wrong in the past. Again, I'll drop the, uh, drop the, link, in, uh, drop the link in chat there. But that was one of the largest... Um, uh, components of uh, GitLab's outage when they had one a uh, a few years back was um, thinking that uh, thinking that backups were being done when uh, backups were were not being done. Yeah, so dangerous. And I love this idea of two is one and one is none because you really got to prepare for the worst. So. As far as you you all and what you've been seeing out there, I know that you got your ear to the street. You're all cool cats. Is there anything that makes you think that as far as like the functionality on doing data on Kubernetes, is it going to be something that is widely adopted? Have you seen it be something that has is going to gain more momentum or do you feel like it's, it's going to stay where it's at? I'd love to talk about that. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> So one thing I would I would say here is I'm a big advocate of running stateful workloads on Kubernetes, but there's a whole lot of caveats that come attached with that. Like I, if if you're going to quote me on saying run stateful workloads on Kubernetes, you have to sign this contract saying you read all the caveats. <laughs> like, because there's this decision, in fact, it's not a decision, there's a model that happens, right? If you run your database on bare metal with no Kubernetes, there's an explicit contract that if something goes wrong, Someone is going to go fix that, right? Some, an alert is going to go and someone is going to go, all right, I know how to fix this and deal with it. On Kubernetes, we have this more implicit contract and it's like, well, I have a reconciliation loop. If something goes wrong, it's going to restart the pod and then people think that's enough and walk away. And rarely is that ever, ever enough. Um, I mean, people, again, I'm saying use stateful sets, which you must do, right? If you want to run stateful workloads, use a stateful set. But that's not guaranteed to work either. And if we use Redis as an example, if you have a five node Redis cluster, the chances are you're deploying it for the Helm chart, which actually gives you a stateful set with something called an ordered guarantee, which is the pods will start in order. However, if you lose enough of those nodes, Redis needs a quorum to come back online. And because of the ordered guarantees, it can never come back online. It's never going to start pod three, four, and six because one is down. And what you actually need there is the ability for an operator to come in and fix it. And I'm a big proponent or fan of the operator model as well. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done in this space. I still think it's really early. But you know, dynamically switching your stateful set from order to parallel um, to recover from disaster like that is really important. And being able to codify that into a Kubernetes operator it's just as mandatory, or you have to have a human doing it, right? You have to really alert, hey, this cluster has lost its quorum. The stateful set will never be able to re- reconcile until manual intervention, and then automate it with an operator. So I do think people should run stateful workloads on Kubernetes. I think it is getting better. 
but we're still a long way from that fully managed experience that I think a lot of people want or expect from Kubernetes as a control plane. Mm. Such a good point. Well, so I want to know about just running Kubernetes on bare metal, how that looks and what, what kind of differences you have. And then are there differences when you're doing data? It's a tricky question, a really tricky question. I mean, there, there, yeah, there, I mean, there are concerns that aren't going to be handled from a bare metal cluster that you would have handled. Like, because the operating system all runs in a VM, um, you have this flexibility where the volumes, even if they're mapped to physical devices, can be attached to, to that VM. When it comes to bare metal, uh, if I, let's back up a little bit, right? When we go to the cloud, we're guaranteed, or no, we have this methodology of cattle over pets, right? If something breaks, we just shoot it. When you own the metal, right, you're stuck with that machine. Like you're using that machine until you decommission it. So it's like, yeah, we don't have the ability. We actually need to look after this. And that includes the disks as well. So there's all these concerns and you need to really be good and try and provide a configuration management system that can be as close to immutable as possible, allowing you to leverage the fast NVMe disks. Like you're not going to get better for databases than a straight up NVMe, right? But you have to have bare metal for that. And then the way that we manage that underlying bare metal changes drastically from a cloud environment. We do need to look after the machines. We can treat them a little bit like cattle and that we can you know, reprovision that OS while keeping the data drives intact. But that needs tooling. It needs people and experience to come in and do all this. Um, and then there's the concept of, like, what's the best example here? If we've got a three node Redis cluster, I have to plan up front how I'm going to pin those pods to specific machines on my cluster where that disk is. I don't have that ability to just detach it and to move over to another bare metal disk, right? That would involve a person in a data center sitting in a wheelie chair going back between machines, and that's just not going to work. Uh, so th there's just all these different things that we have to handle. Um, so the chances are, yeah, you're going to pin pods to the bare metal machines. You're going to look after those machines and keep them as healthy for as long as possible and then deal with disaster recovery when you have to. If you're working with a distributed database, you do have a bit more flexibility. But then if you lose your Kafka node and you have to spin up another one over here, that one then has to get healthy. MongoDB is the same. You have to resync all that data. It has to replicate before that node is ever going to come in, which means you're probably going to over-provision up front, whereas on a cloud, you could probably have a much smaller ceiling like, I mean, all of these different caveats just keep coming in and again, decisions that someone has to make. So bare metal is very different from the cloud. There's a lot of these considerations that are important. You do, it's very difficult to do cattle, pets. Um, you're going to be closer to, to pets every time. Awesome. So I see a question coming through in the chat. Uh, asked 100% agree with David with his comment on NFS. Friends don't let friends run NFS. <laughs> <laughs> what do you folks suggest when your workloads like WordPress or Magneto require RWX? I've looked into all existing solutions one way or the other. They all have, unfortunately, NFS under the hood. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> it comes down to your use case here, right? I. I can give you an answer where you can go and spend thousands of dollars making this work for high performance workloads. And then you tell me it's for WordPress or something like that. And I'm like, well, what's the scale of this site? Like, I mean, I don't want to be the, it depends person, but if you're handling two hits per hour, if you're handling a thousand requests per hour, or you're handling a hundred thousand requests per hour, then that workload is going to change. So if you can predict or know that you're not going to scale beyond a certain threshold, yeah, sure, use something like NFS. It's going to work for a while, but eventually you'll have the pain points of that. Um, and that's when you have to start leveraging other solutions and looking into Portworks, OpenEBS, uh, Ceph, Gluster. While these are going to have a performance hit, there is a certain uh, demographic or kind of application that can handle that hit really well. Again, WordPress is a good example. Is not particularly read and write heavy, has really good caching on the request level, provided you've got that set up right. Then I don't mind the latency on the disk, even taking up to a second for a read or a write. When we get into machine learning and AI and all this other distributed compute that is really disk intensive, 
then the whole scenario changes again and I'm not going to be able to be satisfied with something like Ceph or Gluster or that there. So know the use case and apply the right storage resiliency, redundancy and replication that you need for each kind of concern. Hmm. So I'm seeing another question in the chat and it's at asking, Ian is asking, do you have any tricks or tools for testing that your storage setup is actually resilient to failures, e.g. intentionally crashing pods, pulling disks out, that kind of thing. I guess some chaos engineering. What what would you recommend on that front? Is that for me? <laughs> Either one, whoever wants to jump at it, feel free. If you feel like you can answer it, go for it. Uh, if you so when when doing when doing that sort of yeah like that sort of chaos engineering, um, if your uh, if your weapons grade bold, then sure yay production, but make the like the either the test or staging version of it, and um, do all the things like first of all all the things that you can think of, and then um, go looking for postmortems that mention the same. Uh, the same tech that you're um, that you're building with, and look at its um, look at look at the ways that it uh, the ways that it misbehaves. Um, again, I'll drop a um, uh, uh, drop a link in the chat. The particular uh, postmortem was done uh, Kubernetes and um, and Redis uh, running on SSD, getting super write happy, taking uh, snapshots every every second and um, burning out a uh, burning out that drive before you thought that um, before it's uh, before it's useful lifetime. If you think you're going to get a couple of years out of a particular uh, out of a particular piece or a particular drive, and you're getting less than that, twelve months, twenty four months, then um, then something's going yeah then that's going to break sooner. And that yeah you'll have a plan to uh, a plan to recover from that, but. Um, and yeah, it's hard to be um, it's hard to be on the the tip of the spear and the one who's experiencing those problems. And when you do uh, experience disasters, uh, it's you know very helpful to the community to write those up and uh, and mention the and, and mention the ways in which you were um, um, in which you were burned. Uh, so uh, yeah, like um, go ahead and like, go ahead and, and break things, but. Um, I'm, simulate breaking things don't uh don't send a task grab it to the to the data center with a hammer as that's uh not, not the most not the most productive uh, uh use yeah it would hate to have a wrong rack situation i, I just want to clarify that what jeremy said is, is fucking great advice sorry my, my language but you know people have failed before with all these technologies and finding horror stories or failure stories about the database that you're working with is a really great way to learn and predict things or understand the errors that are going to come that you weren't really familiar with the only thing i would add to what jeremy's saying around you know testing this stuff for simulation which is also really important is test for the workloads that you actually have as well it's all too common when I see people that are running, let's use WordPress because it came up already, right? WordPress is nine times out of 10, a read database. You're reading something from a database. You're not writing to it. Yet people judge their scale by how quickly they can publish new blog posts to that database. Like they're hitting the right API saying, here's a new blog post, here's a new blog post. You're testing the wrong thing as well. I understand what your workloads are, whether they're 90% reads and 10% writes or 90% writes and 10% reads, and really make sure that you hammer that home and test the right thing. It's really easy to go down the rabbit hole and start building a really comprehensive test suite for workloads that you're never going to have in your cluster. Oh, that's such a good point. Yeah, really see what the key value is there and then optimize for that. So let's talk a bit about this because we have kind of segued into it. Uh, have do you have any horror stories that you could tell us about? I'll let you go first, David, and and let us know if you have anything like a war story. And you don't have to mention any names to not get too crazy. But I'd love to hear what are some problems that you've encountered. In yeah, I mean, the biggest challenge I, I I think I've I've had is is just not really understanding the cost implications of setting up this stuff. Like I'm really fortunate 
I guess, to a point that, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and I've only ever deleted a pro production database once. So uh, point in time backups are a really good thing for, for the record. But I've been really lucky, especially as I adopted cloud in the latter years. Um, and uh, I've worked for organizations where I just say, this is how much it's going to cost us to run this and probably over-provisioned everything far too much. And I think that's just as much as a failure as losing data. Um, you know, uh, I worked for a media company circa 2014, 2016. And, you know, we had a very high profile, high traffic website. And, our, you know, my solution to handling that scale was to throw loads of money at RDS. And we over-provisioned massively. We were paying tens of thousands of dollars a month for a database because I didn't understand. I, you know, I'm saying understand your use case. Like if your database is 90% reads, test for that. Yeah, I was the one running the test for the billions of writes every second that we were not having to ever do. So yeah, my biggest failure with databases is just over-provisioning, thinking I can throw money at the problem, it'll go away. And that's just as much a failure for sure. Mm, awesome. How about you, Jeremy? Have you had any war stories you can share with us so we can learn and hopefully not repeat the same mistake twice? <laughs> Like knowing how you're uh, knowing how you're configured is is important. Uh, my like first one is probably college in college times, uh, years and years back. Uh, had uh, getting to, getting toward the end of a project and the um, and the disk I'm working against disappears and uh, yeah, statute of limitations is over on this one. And so uh, Car Carl says. It's it's fine. Like it, the, the it's it's set up as RAID. Just uh, to go in there and, and, and look at the particular server as this one was uh, was on site. And was like, one and zero are not the same. That's the, the duplicating and the striping. And so what ended up being ended up being zero. The uh, yeah, the, the very long story, very short. After like the hair pulling, um, the project ended up being reconstructed from the uh from local work that uh that each of the individual mem uh, members was doing but um remembering to uh, sort of the the trust but verify uh, like if if there's something that's important if there's something that's important to what you're doing and uh, i suppose that makes sense in the uh is is still an issue in the the managed service times like it, something's either uh your fault for um, uh, your fault for construction of it, or your fault for choosing uh, someone else's construction for it. You don't stop being responsible when you uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you when you delegate, whether that's to to someone else or to a to a company. Um, and then I suppose one that the statute of limitations probably hasn't run out on is um, I suppose you can uh, you, you can you can put your toys away preemptively um, at a, a, a company a while back had a um in the uh, notice that all the all the all the monitoring alarms are going off we, we weren't sure if the, and we we're losing machines we weren't sure if there was um uh, a you know, bad actors or if there was a, a much larger problem and once chasing things all the way down it ended up being that the um uh, two two cases like number one the uh, the way that the, uh, the CLI that controlled the cluster was uh, set up was when you would say uh, name redacted, uh, delete, and then the name of the uh, the name of the cluster that you want to delete, it would delete that cluster. You said name redacted, delete, enter. Uh, it would find the name of every running cluster and go ahead and delete those. And if uh, run with the, the same permissions or identity or key as uh, what was in production, the um, in addition to the staging ones, uh, all of uh, all of production would come down to uh, that was uh, recovered from and, and company is still a company. But uh, the the two quick lessons are uh, the like the UI matters, people are going to mistype things and uh, defaulting back to, are you sure instead of, instead of shooting the leg off is usually, uh, is usually preferable. And then yeah. um, if you can operate in um, staging with lower privileges or keep a, 
uh, sort of church and state separation down where um, you're uh, where hurting things and staging is not going to accidentally slip into your uh, production environment um, as much as possible. Mm. The ideal situation is the, uh, is the, is, is the red October scenario or really the, the, the nuclear missile sub scenario, right? Where you have um, two missile keys that have to be turned to do any, uh, to do any real damage. And I suppose that's what we have with um, um, setting things up by configuration where uh, a pull request is done and then, uh, and someone else says yes or no. And you can probably do the, the, the Sean Connery or Mark, Captain Marco thing where you, where you, you know, kill your subordinate and take their missile key, but generally that's not what I'm sorry for ruining Hunt for Red October for anyone who I just did. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I don't it's know. 25 years old? I think it's yeah. I think it's, it's okay. If you haven't seen it by now, you probably aren't going to go see it. And you're not going to search that one out. But you never know with Netflix these days popping up random recommendations. So anyway, back on track. <laughs> and feel free. This is kind of a... Uh, question out of left field. So feel free to let me know if you don't want to answer it, if you don't have any idea on it. But the, I was asking some friends for questions um, that they wanted to ask you all. And one that I got from my friend Paul was asking about how Packet, in his view, was a company that he thought of excelling at building on the edge. And he was wondering if Kubernetes makes sense at the edge. Do you have to make many changes to your architecture to make it work well there versus on the cloud or in the cloud. And either one of you, do, do either one of you feel comfortable with that or want to say pass? I mean, I have a, a really strong opinion on it and the answer is yes. There we uh, go. Kubernetes at the edge is an awesome idea. I think right now it's, there are some challenging components to it, but that's getting easier and better um, probably on a monthly basis right now. So there are a couple of really cool projects out there from Rancher specifically. This KCS, which is a really lightweight, minimal distribution of Kubernetes that can run in lightweight environments such as uh, Raspberry Pis. To be fair, Kubernetes isn't too complicated to running at the edge as is anyway. There are a lot of features that you probably won't use, but you know, running an API server, a kubelet on a couple of machines, whatever, it's actually not too bad. The, the biggest challenge is probably the security aspect of it. Something else that's a really cool project that's in the Kubernetes SIG working group right now is the virtual kubelet, which again opens up a whole world of possibilities for running, you know, a a fake kubelet on tiny little devices where you can predict the workloads up front. Sensorification is a really good example of this. Like if you want to be able to deploy something onto a watch, you can have a fake kubelet that says it's going to do that and work it for you. There's all these weird and cool wacky projects that are surrounding the Kubernetes space. And I think edge compute is a massive thing right now and it's going to get easier and easier all the time. Mm, nice, nice. And Jeremy, if you have anything to add, just feel free to jump in. Um. Depends. And so when talking edge, like how, like how far out is the edge you live, but all the, all the way. Out. So remembering that you're only as good as um, that, that machine is only as good as the, uh, the power network going to it. And so uh, trying to uh, make sure all that's in good shape. Nice. So I have another question here uh, asking about, the saying, given the workloads uh, are CPU bound or memory bound, do you find that running on ARM changes how you have to think about provisioning? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're going to see a major uptick of ARM in, in the container and Kubernetes spaces, you know, low, comp, low, that low power chips that can are just as powerful as, you know, the other alternatives that we have right now is a fantastic option. Packet has really good ARM support and we work closely with ARM to make sure that, you know, things are getting better. The only challenge right now running containers on ARM machines is multi-arch images are an absolute pain in the ass. Like not all of the official images ship with a manifest, not all of the official images ship with a build specifically for ARM. And until that changes, until we get better at producing multi-arch images, it's always going to be a challenge running containers on ARM-based computers right now. 
Now, I, I do see that getting easier. There, there is a lot of good work happening in this space. You can follow the people at Docker. You can follow, you know, Arm themselves are quite, uh, quite active in the space. You know, there's Slack channels, there's forums, there's all sorts of things. It's trying to get better. I think it's inevitable now that Arm just takes over this space, and you know, hmm. the tooling's getting better, but it's not there yet. Nice, nice. So I asked your colleague, Jason, for a question for you all. And he was wondering, how do you strike the right balance between meeting developers where they are and more appropriate data management? When is it okay to let them cube cuddle exec CP versus the learning curve involved to do things the right way? Let me try and rephrase that question that I understood it. Jason's asking, do we let developers shoot their own foots a few times before teaching them the right way? Or do we try and encourage them to learn the right way up front? My personal opinion is I've made a lot of mistakes in my life <laughs> and software, I'll say. Like I've spent 20 years of doing things wrong in a very public fashion. And I think I've learned an awful lot from that approach. So I like to give people a bit of a, a bit of a long rope, let them make mistakes, and then try and guide them when they when they, they suffer. You know, if I sit here and say, Oh, you have to compare this Docker image for ARM and you have to go use this this container technology, you have to go use container D and not Docker, and you have to go through this. If you don't understand the why, the what, then impossible to reason about. So um, give people a long rope, let them make mistakes and, and be there to support them and recover. Because you know what? The way that we handle failure is just as important as the way we handle our success. Hmm. Jeremy, you have any thoughts on that? Anything to add? Mostly follow on the, I tend to meet folks where they are because, uh, and uh, the, uh, especially in, in on the advocacy front, the, for the empathy that's required, like there's not the, there's not the, how do you got here without the, the why? And it's very rare that, um, it was bad intent. It usually, uh, when you know better, you'll do better. And so providing that, uh, good example, but not forcing it down anyone's throat. Mm. Yeah. Great to hear. So now I'm, I'm wondering about remote disks and the future of remote disks. What do you feel that looks like? How do you, David, I hear you laughing a little bit. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, I'm, I'm laughing because I would love to have, you know, NMV over fabrics, over, over TCP, anything, you know. I, it's something, again, I had this experience when I first started out my career. I was working for a company that published a CDN for skills in Scotland. Uh, you know, we had distributed computing across all of Scotland so skills could download stuff fast under really archaic connections. And one of the ways that we did that was was over SANS. You know, we actually had disks available over fiber arrays in all of these locations. And and here I am 20 years later asking for the same thing. And I'm like, why is this just not common ground when it comes to disks in the data center? And of course, there's loads of things we have to worry about, the security implications and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I want to see NVMe. I want to see it come over fiber, TCP, all of these things that really solve a big problem for databases on Kubernetes. Um, I'd like it yesterday, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Now, let's talk about the different open source projects that you are a part of right now. I know that you, David, you're doing stuff with Kubernetes itself. You're on the release team. Can you give us other stuff that you're working on? Yeah, sure. No problem. So yeah, I try to be as active as possible in the Kubernetes space. It's a tool that I've been using, you know, for nearly five years now. So it, it's good to keep in touch on that. And like I said, the amount of improvements coming out of it are, are, are fantastic. I think that the data layer aspect of it is definitely improving. I'm, I'm impressed by what Portworks, Portworks are doing in OpenEBS. Um, I think Rook is really cool. You know, that's probably the de facto standard right now for running a Ceph cluster on Kubernetes. And I think the amount of effort they've put into making them that almost trivial, to be honest, um, is great. And if you're working for, if, if your organization or your product can handle the performance of that, that's definitely the way to go. Other things I'm really interested in, you know, I used to work at Influx Data, who are responsible for InfluxDB, which is a time series database, and I'm really interested in the applications of that on Kubernetes. Um, and that's a classic example of, you know, 
your InfluxDB cluster is almost 99% write workload versus a very small percentage of read workloads. And then the performance mm-hmm. characteristics of that, you're not going to get away with running that on a Ceph cluster with Rook and, and, and looking at NVMe, uh, NVMe over TCP and those other new solutions to these problems are really important for that space, especially around observability, monitoring, all of this newfangled stuff that we're trying to piece together to understand our clusters and our workloads on that cluster. Um, are really important. So I'm still quite active with InfluxDB as a community um, and excited to see these new technologies help that. Awesome. How about you, Jeremy? Uh, so the internal one and coming up to speed on the uh, the Tinkerbell project that, uh, that Packet has released to open source uh, tool for uh, provisioning uh, bare metal. And so as you... Uh, uh, either folks coming over from using cloud where it's, you know, previously as simple as issuing an API command and you're like, all right, now you have a VM. Uh, it's not the same. It's not quite the same with, uh, 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 here's some bare metal and you're like, now do something. And, uh, that was like, that was the whole point of packet was providing that API for bare metal. But if you want to go beyond here, put, put Ubuntu on a, uh, a T1 medium, or um, here are the li- here's the list of uh, supported uh, operating systems. If you uh, if you're, um, want something more custom than that, taking in being able to uh, control uh, machines in uh, data centers that you um, don't have physical access to. And I say don't have physical access to, not because you're not allowed in there as a, as a customer. Yes, you can go through the uh, the rigmarole that's required to fly to the place and get into place and go through the man trap and the whole story. But the, uh, to the extent that it can be made uh, unnecessary to do any of that, and all of that can be uh, uh, set up and managed from wherever you have an internet connection, uh, that's a, a, a project that I'm uh, excited to work more on and then uh, excited to communicate more to the uh, a larger community of the, both the folks uh, internal and external of the company of the, uh, of the advances that are being made there. Nice. Tinkerbell too. What a great name. <laughs> Kudos to whoever gave that name. I like it. So at the risk of repeating ourselves, I'd love to just kind of finish up with this idea that we came here for today, right? The doing data wrong. And I know, David, you mentioned, wow, there's some really cool stuff going on with OpenEBS, Portworks, and once you get into Ceph, what is happening there? Do you have anything that you could tell us about doing it wrong when it comes to the storage level and how to not do it wrong? Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell a different failure story then. So... A lot of these technologies, you know, people are are hesitant to adopt for various factors, right? You know, sometimes that extra replication load of the underlying data store, that 9x, is not something that people really have the ability to to handle. Um, Maybe it's edge compute is maybe an example. And what I see a lot of people do is going, well, why don't we just store all of this data in memory and have a write-ahead log on the disk? And that seems really good for a while. Um, The challenge with that, and something I've run into before, and I've seen other companies do it, is... You really need to understand what that write what that write ahead log is, right? It is a write performance path to so you can get faster writes. It also means the data in that memory space is really good for compressing down to the disk format eventually. Really, really terrible from a read aspect. So what a lot of I say a lot of companies. I mean me. I'm the failure here. Is that you know I think well why not just use the RAM? I have this this machine that's got 32 gig of RAM, why don't I allocate 24 of it to this right ahead log in memory and see how it'll work, right? Fine. The challenge with that is, is that the read latency gets far too painful eventually, especially as that right ahead log grows. And then the writes start to degrade because you have to then have consistency guarantees with the reads requests. And then heaven forbid that that crashes and you have to re- read this right ahead log back into memory when that pod restarts. And that is where it just all falls to pieces. And I've been burned by that more than once now. The right ahead log's too big, pod crashes, it then takes 45 minutes to read the 24 gig back into memory. What what am I even doing at this point? So um, be careful with right ahead logs. They sound great 
and they work really well, but you really got to keep a cap on that size, make sure you're flushing it to disk, rebuilding your indices, and making sure your startup time is not going to be compromised as a, a very nasty knock-on effect of that growing too big. Mm. Such nice wisdom, and we can tell that, yeah, you've learned through experience there. That's something more that than I once, imagine. which means I haven't learned it properly. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh man, how many times am I going to do this and have to go through this whole thing again? But it'll be okay this time because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so you've tried to tweak it a few times and it just hasn't worked out, huh? Exactly, right? Just just drop it a few gigs. The problem was just the last two gigs, right? It wasn't the other 22. <laughs> so let that be a warning to you all listening that it doesn't matter the gigs. You can try and drop it a few gigs, but it's still, it's the fundamental underlying design of that whole thing, I guess, is what I'm hearing you say the, the final thing i'll add to that is that you can leverage a pure and memory store like redis is great for cash right something i can sacrifice when that pod restarts if you need consistency guarantees then you're using the right you're abusing a right ahead log at that point and that's where it's going to get really painful as well mm -hmm. those are use cases where it works really well just make sure again you understand them all right. Awesome. So Jeremy, I'll let you give us some final words on this. Do you have anything to say about doing data wrong? Um, remember, think about what that data is and, and, and where it is. So even outside the Kubernetes front, um, one of the ways to do things wrong is keep too much of it. Oftentimes, uh, <laughs> they're like for, um, for reasons you're like, you, you want it all. And so you keep it all. And you don't need it all. Let uh, let some of, let some of that tail off. Uh, uh, keeping things in the wrong place, like can't you know, have no nowhere near the time that's required to go into talking GDPR. But more and more, it matter like uh, it matters what your data is and who it belongs to and and where it's placed. Uh, it, it's it's not just ones and zeros. If those ones and zeros are of national security interest, you're going to prison. And so. Uh, as much as we like looking at the shi at, at the shiny new thing, um, remember like old best practices that were a thing when um, you were uh, disk constrained and any sort of resource constrained. Um, just like uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so, I would say don't do things wrong by um, both uh, collecting and retaining too much data, both from the ethical and the legal um, uh, standpoints. Such a good point. It is so true. Like why go through the necessary pain of just collecting and retaining all of this data that you may or may not need, right? So I think you you both have brought home some incredible points and I wanna thank you both for joining us today. This has been really helpful, helped me understand things more. I appreciate it. I've been excited for this chat for the last couple of weeks and it did not um, let me down, so. Thank you both, Jeremy, David, and thank you all for staying with us, whoever is still here. If anyone wants to reach out to you guys, what's the best way to do it? Probably Twitter. I'm on there about 23 hours, 45 minutes per day. So <laughs> there we go. And you are at Raw Code, right? R A W K O D E, Raw Code. That's right. There he is. And Jeremy, same. And sa same for myself. Uh, Penguin, spelled like the flightless bird uh, on, <laughs> on the Twitter. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for having us. Yeah, it's no been problem. a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. I uh, will see you all later. They, you are both in the Slack too. So that's another place that you, yep. they, you can chat with them and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you all. We'll see you later. Adios.